Welcome to Foresight's Existential Hope Podcast. Really, really happy to see so many of you here. Um, today, we have a really, really wonderful guest, um, Morgan Levine, uh, who I think um, is, uh, is quite well known to many of you. Nevertheless, I'll do a very, very brief intro before we hear hopefully much more from Morgan. Um, and so Morgan is um, really since this year, right? A uh, founding principal investigator at Altos Labs um, and an assistant professor at Yale. Um, and you're researching uh, epigenetic mechanisms of cellular and systems health. You're quite outspoken. So I think it really makes sense for folks that are interested in staying up to date with Morgan's work to follow her on Twitter. Um, uh, it's, uh, I think it's a, yeah, it's really a thing inspiring what, um, yeah, like your leadership in the field and the kind of like grace with which you do this. Um, and um, yeah, we're really, really happy to have you on. This is obviously a little bit of a different seminar than I think what you're used to in our groups. Um, we had Morgan on for a biotech and health extension seminar together with Jamie Justice in the last year. And that is still one of the most cherished um, seminars uh, of that series. And I'm still getting emails <laughs> asking me for more information on your work um, pretty regularly uh, these days. And uh, that space of biomarkers and biomarker standardization is obviously one that uh, we can maybe touch on a little bit in the interview as well, because I think it's something that which of which relevance but won't go away anytime soon. Um, but maybe we'll just start with a quick introduction. Um, perhaps you can just introduce yourself and uh, what, what you're working on and how it, how you came to uh, have the focus in your life that uh, you're currently on. Yeah, thank you so much, Alex. And I'm excited to be a part of this. I always love all of the interactions with the Foresight group. And this one, I'm excited to this kind of unique, different um, interaction. So yeah, my lab, as you mentioned, it's really excited about understanding mostly the molecular changes that cells undergo that we think is a part of the aging process. And we focus a lot on epigenetics um, and mostly from the framework that I think of the epigenome as the operating system of a cell. So it really gives the cell its phenotype and its traits and its functioning ability. Um, I came to aging research a little bit. I didn't actually think I was going to be a scientist growing up. I, it was not my plan from an early age. Like I think a lot of scientists say it was. And I actually didn't realize I wanted to be a scientist till after undergrad. Um, although I was always really interested in aging because um, my father was quite a bit older when I was born. So he was in his 50s. So I was always very concerned about it. But it wasn't until I got exposed to the idea that we actually have potential power to intervene in this and we don't have to just take it lying down um, that I really got interested in the field and kind of figuring out why we age and if there's any way to slow that down or in the future potentially reverse it. Wow, wonderful. Um, and was there like a particular moment uh, in your life when you got to on, on the current track that you cur are currently on or was it more like a gradual progression of like individual steps that got you through university gradually more interested I mean, it might sound cliche, but actually, um, I will give the credit to my husband. So I, I met my husband right after undergrad and he was in a physics PhD program and just through all the conversations with him. And I, it made me get really excited about science and research. Um, he was in a totally different field. He wasn't working on aging or anything at the time. Um, but yeah, it made me think, oh, wait, I want to be a scientist too. Um, if he can do it, so can I. And so I think that after that is when I um, enrolled at USC in their uh, aging program to do my PhD. And then just the exposure to the faculty there, I think, really solidified that for me. Well, wonderful. And um, could you maybe give provide some color as to what it exactly is that you are currently focused on? And Maybe then also give like a view behind the scenes of what it actually means day to day to be a scientist. Like what, uh, what does your job actually look like? <laughs> yeah. So, so we're again, really focused on, can we understand kind of the language of the epigenome and how epigenetic changes can really differentiate what we might consider a healthy cell. So a cell that's functioning the correct way in a population of cells from maybe a dysfunctional or unhealthy cell, which we think accumulate with age and, and what drives those changes and is there any way to reverse them or is this kind of just stochastic error that would be too difficult to reverse? Um, so that's a lot of what my lab is currently focused on. Um, at Yale, I, I can kind of give an idea, but although 
because I'm transitioning, my day-to-day is going to completely change. But for the past few years, my lab at Yale, I run um, a team of about 11 to 12 scientists. Um, About half of them are traditional, uh, what we consider bench scientists working in the lab, doing a lot of cell culture work, some uh, rodent work. And then about the other half is computational scientists. Um, So I don't spend a lot of time in the lab. I mean, I go visit, but I'm not pipetting or doing anything else. I do, I have occasionally passage cells, but that's not my forte. Um, So I have a lot of meetings with uh, my team and I still love running data. So I do a lot of analysis whenever I can fit it in, but a lot of my time is taken up with meetings and coming up with ideas. And once I transition to Altus, I think it'll, I think there'll just be more direct interaction with my team and then other teams that'll be really close by and hopefully we'll have this kind of hyper collaborative environment there. Wow. Okay. Well, I know that the process of the change is currently undergoing, um, but uh, if, what, if anything, can you share about that transition? And I know it's all fresh and, and so forth, and we don't need to uh, uh, go into anything that, uh, that would be, um, you know, not, not relevant to talk about yet, but um, yeah, how is that transition from academia into your, uh, your new career um, role? And um, yeah, what, if anything, can you share about this? I'm sure that I, I'm not the first one to ask. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I can share a little bit. So I think, you know, also this is structured in a very u- unique way for a private institution in that it's actually structured much more like university. So actually my kind of lab and day-to-day won't necessarily change. I will still have a team of about the same number of people working on almost exactly the same types of topics we were doing it. Um, I just won't have all the other administrative and grant writing and other things. So I'll, I feel like I'll get to really um, absorb all kind of the scientific discussions and really be much more involved than, than traditional, traditionally I would be able to do in academia because you just have so many other things with committee meetings and, you know, writing grants and everything else. So taking that away, I can just do the science and but the scientific part should be similar to what I'm doing now. Yeah, we recently had um, interviewed um, Clarice Dariello in our biotech group, and she said that she spends about 30 hours per week um, writing grant proposals, which was, <laughs> was mind-boggling. I knew it was a lot, but I did not know it was this much. So I'm uh, really happy to hear that your precious time is being freed up uh, for other things. Um, cool. So um, could you um, maybe just provide, um, because, you know, this uh, interview series is also geared at folks that, you know, are not into the nitty bitty um, weeds of uh, aging um, uh, and, and the entire space. So could you potentially just maybe provide um, like a, a somewhat of a bird's eye view of the field? I know that, for example, you've been really outspoken on Twitter about um, not being excited at some of the snake oil that's, uh, you know, that, 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 that is a part of the field. And I, I really salute you for speaking out on it. I think on one hand, it is kind of like, um, it, it is showing just how much attention is getting the, is the, the space is getting now, which is very different to, to even just five years ago, which is great in itself that more people are like piling on and, and are rebranding their um, their bids. But on the other hand, I think like quality control is I think that something that is like the space um, yeah is uh, is is a in deep need of, and I think it's really uh, inspiring how you are like out there and actually trying to make sure that the community is flourishing in a in a, in a great way. So maybe for like an outsider, what if anything, could you say about like what the space uh, and uh, of aging really uh, entails and what gets you excited about it? Yeah, I mean, I think we're at a re- really unique time. So aging has always, I think, had snake oil. I think actually in the past, the majority of aging, not in the recent past, but has been snake oil. Or, you know, humans, we we are naturally opposed to our own deterioration and mortality. So it, it's very easy to tell someone that, oh, I have a solution for this, probably most people's biggest fears in life. Um, I think right now it's unique because the science is really accelerating probably more than it ever has. And it's really hard to now distinguish what's the real rigorous, true valid science from kind of things that look more like they did in the past, which is this not very you know, kind of the squishies like snake oil 
pseudoscience. And, you know, people throw around a lot of big terms that make it sound like what they discovered or what they're selling is, you know, very scientific and rigorous. But I think it is hard um, for people on the outside to be able to actually judge the credibility. I think I would just, anything that's been sold, I would really look at who's selling it, whether there are independent academics who support whatever it is. Um, not academics who are also financially invested in it, but just completely independent people uh, look at the research, although it can be contradictory. You can find things that support one thing, but then also things that don't. So yeah, I think it's just hard. And I would, I would tell people from the get-go, although we want to be optimistic, be a little bit cautious of anything that sounds too good to be true. Yeah, I think that's generally good advice in life, <laughs> um, but uh, but especially in this space. Yeah, so, and, and I think you were right that probably there was a lot of uh, snake gold, but um, it really never, uh, um, one could never tell very much because there just also wasn't very much interest <laughs> in um, in this space. And so so now I think it uh, it becomes more relevant. Um, and, you know, you are working um, really specifically, and maybe that's like one of, you know, the last question about like the, the aging and, uh, and longevity work in particular, but um, you know, you, we, in your previous biotech um, and health extension seminar together with Jamie Justice, we focused on biomarker standardization. Um, and I think that is definitely, you know, really on par with the quest of trying to figure out, you know, what are, what are we actually trying to do in, as, as a field? So perhaps could you bring people up to speed a little bit on like why biomarkers are interesting, relevant, why standardization is, is something to focus on and why are we yeah, trying to hone in on the metrics here? Yeah, uh, I mean, biomarkers are going to be really critical to anything in the field of aging, especially in human aging, because, you know, the the outcomes that we always relied upon in the past doing animal studies are things like mortality or disease, which, you know, in the time scale of a human study is just unreasonable. Um, so we really do need to have biomarkers that can, in kind of real time, assess how well either an intervention's doing or just for individuals tracking their own aging, whether whether they're kind of on the right track, or also kind of discovering new therapeutics that can that may actually have a benefit towards either slowing or reversing the aging process. Um, that being said, like all of the different kind of subfields in aging research, biomarkers are also plagued by some snake oil and pseudoscience. So it's very easy to sell someone a biomarker and have it not actually be a valid or even reliable measure because there's nothing for anyone to check it against. So I, you know, someone gives me a quote biological age estimate. I have no ground truth to say whether that's real. You know, I could give someone any number. Um, so again, I think it's really important to make sure we have kind of these standard um, criteria that biomarkers should have to meet for us to even consider them as potential um, tools in aging. So for me, the ones that I kind of go on are, you know, probably the simplest one is you should have something that correlates with chronological age, because if it doesn't even track with chronological age, it's probably not measuring something related to aging. Um, but probably the harder thing is that any kind of divergence or discordance between chronological age. So let's say if you're chronologically 50, but your biological age says you're 55, that difference should actually be biologically meaningful. And we can test that in a bunch of different ways. You can say among people the same chronological age, does differences in biological age relate to things like disease incidents or things like mortality risk? Um, so that's kind of how we go about validating these. Um, and then another really important thing that I think has been somewhat overlooked in the biomarker field comes back to kind of the reliability of the biomarkers. So what I mean is if I measured the same biomarker twice in an individual in a very short amount of time, do I get the same answer? Or is it really noisy where that, that value that you're actually given is not that meaningful because it's a plus or minus five years or 10 years or whatever it may be? So I think in evaluating biomarkers or even in consumers who are, you know, wanting to track things, those are really important criteria to make sure that whatever you're using 
is actually meeting those at a very minimum. And then of course we can improve them even beyond that. Yeah, thanks. I think it's really establishing an entire field from the ground up. So the ground, the, yeah, the, the ground setting work is, is super important. Thanks for, uh, for doing that. Um, Okay, wonderful. So I think that, you know, that uh, at least for now uh, closes my, um, my bag of, um, of aging related questions. Uh, I think you'll get them asked probably lots of thanks for it just bringing people up to speed. Um, I'm still always surprised by, um, because I think it's very easy to um, kind of be um, tricked by your own filter bubble, or at least for me, um, where you, you think that this is already a field that now everyone pays attention to. But I do think that onboarding folks that may not know why this is something that they should care about um, or could care about um, is, uh, is great. And you provide a great vision to that. So thanks. Um, okay, next up, we have Beatrice um, with a few more existential hope focus questions, which is um, like, I guess, the special taste of this podcast. We're really trying to inspire folks about why the long-term future for themselves and for civilization uh, at large could be uh, really exciting and uh, what um, specific people uh, that we think have a really good hunch for why the future is exciting, what makes the person excited about it. So Beatrice, I'll hand it over to you. Yeah. Yeah. So these are, I guess, a bit more philosophical questions than you might be used to answering, Morgan. Um, but yeah, we're, we're particularly interested in hearing like your perspective as the scientist on these questions. Um, yeah. And that's, you know, the concept of the, the podcast is to, to get like different perspectives and get different I mean, we're also very interested in technology, obviously, of foresight. So, um, yeah, the first one is a very, very difficult one, I guess. But um, it's just if you think about the concept of existential hope, do you have any uh, or can you envision any 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 potential futures of existential hope? And what do they look like as compared to a vision of com existential angst or something? I mean, I think if I'm understanding it correctly, I, for me, it's just the realization that we have kind of the power to probably create whatever future we want. Um, and now I think with the science and technology kind of exponential growth, we, we do have the tools, not just kind of the imagination to actually realize that. And I think just making sure that we are you know, setting our goals high and, you know, human, humans have shown that we have amazing potential to actually realize things that seemed completely um, impossible. So I just feel like, yeah, trying to, trying to maintain optimism, but uh, maybe this will come up later, but still being semi-realistic and not, not overselling it before we've actually realized it. Yeah. And that, that fits really well in with, with what I wanted to ask you next, which is just like, um, well, we, we know that to make this happen, we probably need new technology or, uh, you know, advance the fields of science that can help us reach, reach this future. Um, and I'm assuming on your end, uh, anti-aging things, uh, are, are relevant, but do you see, um, so how does that fit into this future? And also how, if you see any other technologies that you think are important to get there and, and any potential risks also. Yeah, I mean, I think probably to be able to do this, it comes down to kind of computational sciences too. So to realize, I think, at least my perspective, to realize the goals we have for aging, we also need to kind of be able to really model and predict and eventually know how to intervene in this really complex process um, that we call aging. And so that'll really require good, you know, computational infrastructure and computing, but also uh, mathematics and data science. And we're already, not we, but as a humanity is already amassing huge amounts of data, but just having the, the talent and the ability to analyze that data to actually get what we need out of it, I think is going to be the major kind of leap forward, hopefully in the next coming decades. Yeah. Do, and do you see any risks with that data as well? Or is it? Yeah, I mean, definitely. I Data science, of course, is not perfect. It's, you know, they say like garbage in, garbage out. So we, we need to make sure that you don't take everything that comes out of uh, some of these things at face value. And we're still 
being critical and not leaving, you know, all of the kind of science up to what you might consider like the AI. Um, and, you know, as humans, we're still injecting, whether it's morality or any of these other things to make sure, because at least for me, the thing that worries me the most about success in a, in actually intervening and in aging is if it causes increased disparities over what we have today. So, I mean, the biggest a uh, differentiator in lifespan today is things like socioeconomic status. And I am a little bit worried that, you know, as we move forward, that could either stay the same or potentially even grow. So making sure we're also, you know, keeping these social things that are not part of the, the bio biotechnology um, in mind as well. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, but would you, would you describe yourself as optimistic about the future? And and if so, like, you know, what what makes you optimistic, and uh, why do you think that is? Yeah, I mean, I I am very optimistic about the future. I feel like just, I mean, since I've even started in this field, the number of exciting discoveries to come along has been huge, and you know that'll only grow exponentially over time. So, uh. It's very hard to speculate where we'll be in the future, but I can imagine that there are huge discoveries kind of on the horizon in aging or other kind of related fields that will will totally transform medicine, but also just kind of overall health and how we view kind of our entire life course um, in the years to come. Yeah, definitely. I I think one thing that we often come across in uh, in this group, for example, is that people that it's it's hard to um, think uh, about the future, um, especially the long term future, in ways that are you know either concrete because we don't know what's going to happen, uh, or uh, just thinking about positive visions of the future because we all only see the um, everything that can go wrong. Um, and there's a lot that can go wrong. Um, but why do you have any, any thoughts on why you think it's so different to, to have the, to think positively about the future or to, to have that, um, filter on instead? I mean, I think we have to just do that because I mean, there's always going to be, I mean, the current events are, are obviously a, a an example of all the things that can go wrong and are not um, necessarily with, in all our control. Um, but I think too, just realizing what is in your control to kind of help create this positive future and focusing in on that, obviously doing what you can um, when, when, you know, maybe not positive things are happening, but, you know, really just instead of dwelling on that kind of figuring out how you can create a better future or what there is you can do and always having that kind of a circle. Yeah. And if we sort of uh, imagine someone new to this, new to your field coming in, um, is there anything in particular that you would recommend that they um, dive in? Like, where do they dive in? Is it a book? It can be, it can be a movie. It can be, um, yeah, fiction or nonfiction. Do you have any recommendations on? Um, I mean, I think there are really interesting books that aren't, they're not necessarily aging books. Um, uh, I mean, I liked, uh, I mean, Schrodinger like decades ago wrote a book, What is Life? That I still think is like a, a fabulous book to think about biology and life. And he doesn't, directly talk about aging, but so many of the topics you can extrapolate to, under, to thinking about aging. He t to some degree, he talks about it, but not explicitly. Um, there are other really great books. I think one recently, and I feel really bad, I'm forgetting the author's name, called uh, Antifragility, which is really cool about understanding kind of complexity. Um, so yeah, I think there are a lot of really exciting science books that make you rethink about like, you know, I think I always think of aging, studying aging as really in line with the whole scientific question of what is life, what makes complex life, what maintains complex life. Um, 
And so just looking so any books that kind of touch on that, I think are really exciting. I think I yeah. just um, the yeah. book Virgil is and I seem to like. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and if someone, if we keep thinking of someone new, they've, they've read this, uh, these books that you recommend, um, where, and they want to really contribute to these positive futures. What do you think they should specialize in? Is it, is it something particular within the longevity movement you think they should specialize in? I mean, I, I always come back to, I think data science, I, I think that's really going to be the future of how we do science. Of course, we need the hardcore, true molecular and cellular biologists to make sense of the data science. Um, but so much of what we see is kind of this transition over to big data, um, machine learning, and, you know, the, the topics we study are so complex that this is really the only way we're going to truly be able to understand um, some of the phenomenon that we're actually interested in, not just modeling and tracking, but hopefully intervening in and just knowing how to intervene, I think is going to really require these computational tools. Uh, yeah, I was super interested when you mentioned earlier that uh, you have like some benchmark scientists and then also many folks actually that are just computational uh, biologists, like uh, really first. And we are, for example, currently planning a workshop later this year on enabling tools for biotech. And obviously there's not only the uh, like software automation, but ultimately also lots of physical lab automation. And super curious, are you at all looking into that as well in your lab or is it mostly, okay, let's get the software angle right first before we even start thinking about the, the, the physical lab automation bits? Oh, no, I can definitely, um, I think I'm allowed to say this. So, I mean, Altos is definitely looking into these things. So I'm not personally, I'm kind of relying on the infrastructure there. But yeah, this is, I think, too, something else that's going to really accelerate science um, a ton. Yeah, like when I usually talk uh, to a few people about that who are actively working on it, they usually said that um, one big problem, I think, on this was that for every individual uh, lab trying to figure the physical um, automation out, it is almost always cheaper just to do it with a student um, or, or to do it like with someone and like physically doing it just because of all of the finessing and boutique work that's required. But then on the long run, uh, if only we could have like great templated solutions and then, then it could maybe sense. So I think that, that there really is some, some big potential here to, uh, to, to obviously getting this right. Um, and you know, you mentioned a little earlier, the kind of like huge, huge swaths of, uh, of data analysis that we have to, uh, really, I think get, get better at, like, what do you think, do you, do you think that there's a particular bottleneck that you often run into, um, when, for example, one thing that often comes up at our competitions is that there's not really a good data statistization or like really like some uh, different experiments use very different metrics. They obviously don't even share the experiments that went wrong. And so people are like reinventing the wheel the whole time. And are there any specific bits where you're just like, oh, this is, uh, you know, something that not me, but probably other labs face too. And if only someone could solve this, like that would really unlock, uh, unlock a lot of progress on, on your end. Yeah, no, I think this is a huge issue. I mean, there are so many labs around the world collecting data, but having it harmonized and having it in a usable kind of format that you could use all, you know, people could actually use all the data and making sure you actually have open science that works. I think it's a huge problem. And, and, and I think you touched upon it. The other thing that always worries me is that the only data or even papers that actually make it out into kind of the public sphere are things that worked or things that um, had positive results. So this could definitely bias our science, especially, again, this comes back to this idea of when you're using really um, advanced computational tools, if you are, if you have kind of a bias in what you're sampling from, because you're only sampling from the experiments that got a positive result, you might not actually be getting the real answer because you, you already have bias built into kind of the data that you're analyzing. So, I mean, for me, I think it's the bottleneck will be having like a true open science kind of, um, kind of just way of thinking, right? So like people will put up data that maybe they are kind of abandoned because they didn't prove out their hypothesis or they didn't, um, yeah, 
they failed to reject the null hypothesis. Um, and yeah, just trying to take the bias out of it and really making it about searching for the truth and not just who made the big splash and how, you know, the way science um, basically incentivizes people, I think really creates bias within the scientific community unintentionally. Yeah, I think um, there, like, you know, I mean, I come from like, a, I guess, like preparing school for, of like a science, he founded the, the philosophy department that I was in uh, and uh, you know, it's, um, for me, it was all falsification, right? And you can't really do falsification well if you can't like learn from mistakes, if the mistakes and the things that didn't work out are kind of hidden. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. and so I think, and I think that is something that A, the Bay Area and the US has a, is, is a little bit better at than even I would say Europe. I think in Europe, failing is, uh, is, is seen in a, in a, in even in a, in a, yeah, in just really not, not a really great light. But even I think in the US, obviously, just in terms of um, having, more of the failed experiments actually shown, um, I think there would be like a tremendous unlock. And uh, I think what you mentioned about open science, it's interesting, like we just did a um, decentralized science um, track at a, um, like at a Web3 conference um, in, in Denver. And there's now a ton of tool building within the more uh, crypto leaning spaces that is trying to move into the science. And at the same time, I think the two are still really quite different. So are there any specific like open science projects or like, uh, you know, specific um, yeah, efforts that you're aware of. I feel like there's a lot kind of cooking up right now. Um, but um, but yeah, are there any specific ones that, that you think are interesting? I mean, there are good uh, kind of open science data resources online um, that I think have really changed how we, we think about these things. So, I mean, we, we get a ton of our data from Gene Expression Omnibus, which is all open science. But again, it's not well harmonized, right? People can put up just whatever data they want. And half the time, I think people put up not all the data because they want to keep some of it. Um, they don't want to share everything. Um, but things like TCGA, the, the Cancer Genome Atlas is a good um, example. There's some for Alzheimer's disease. Um, and then, you know, things like UK Biobank and stuff. But I do, and, and um, ENCODE and stuff. But I, I mean, one thing I, I, I'm really excited by all of the involve, involvement from the private sector, although I do worry that this will kind of change the the move towards open science, right? Because they're potentially uh, companies are going to be slightly less open um, than academic labs. But I'm maybe wrong on that. I'm hoping that I am. Um, wonderful. Yeah, it sounded like um, you know when you said that much of the work that. Um, you know, you may maybe doing it out of almost looks very much like university work. So I do think that oftentimes um, founders that I meet of private companies, they have a pretty enlightened actually um, uh, view of what it is that companies doing. And they, uh, they are taking, I think, more uh, long-term bets than I've seen many, um, you know, pre previously more uh, public sector um, uh, organizations take. So I think it's really exciting. Like people are really stepping up and, uh, and, and yeah, it's wonderful. Um, do you have any, um, and, and again, I don't know how much you can share there, but is there like, are there any specific bits that people can be excited about that may um, come like that may come out of Altos or your work soon um, from, yeah, from, from more of an, uh, I guess, professional angle? I mean, I think for me, the thing that excited me about Altos and made me, you know, not just willing to leave my academic position, but excited to lead to join this new entity is that there's not really stated goals in terms of discoveries it's much more kind of like a bell labs model where it's we can ask just the most interesting questions we can think of they can be high risk um uh problems to work on and there's no kind of assumption of what is going to come out in terms of something that's you know potentially tra translational um that being said um most great discoveries that, you know, translational discoveries that go on to impact human health or, or technology or whatever it is came out of basic science. So I think this is a thing for, that made me really think that Altos is onto something in that there's no, I think people who chase specific discoveries, um, actually fail a lot more than people who 
are more agnostic and say, we just want to understand the problem and we'll just, dis- we'll discover things we never even knew, you know, what were there. I mean, thinking about Chris, things like CRISPR, like there was never the goal to discover CRISPR. It just came out of like the most basic science you can ever imagine. So the idea that hopefully that we discover is like that just from doing this. Um, so it's very hard for me to say what will come out, but I'm excited that something we can't even imagine will hopefully come out in the coming decade or so. Yeah, I think that in itself is already, um, yeah, it's a pretty good um, indicator, I think, for the types of things that um, th- that may be more downstream. And I, those are other kinds of bets, I think, that haven't been taken very much um, previously and that now people are like are willing to take in. So it's, I think it's an extremely exciting time, I think, to be actually working in this space. Um, and OK, wonderful. Um, so maybe to um, kind of like segue again into the more uh, existential uh, hopey bits. Um, so we usually what we uh, ask our guests is, um, there's this term, basically the part of the podcast is really inspired by this one paper on existential hope that Toby Ord and Owen Cotton Barron wrote. Uh, and in that they referenced Tolkien. And uh, Tolkien had this term of a new catastrophe which is uh, the opposite of a catastrophe. It's the sudden switch in a story from uh, like a more of an unhappy ending to the happy one. Um, And, um, and I think we are, you know, often very, especially currently, you know, you were just alluding to like current events and, and, and the kind of like, um, yeah, pretty, uh, yeah, agonizing factor that that has in our day-to-day lives. But I think we're like pretty uh, soaked in in catastrophic moments, uh, often mimetically. Um, and so I wonder if, you know, especially right now, um, if there is an event, something that would for you market that we have hit something like a eucatastrophic moment, where after that um, moment, the world actually looks a little bit brighter than before. Like, is there like a specific either scientific event or like a specific event that, you know, you could imagine in, the, um, in, in our human future, after which you're much more hopeful that the future will go well. Like, is there such a switch point? Yeah, I mean, I don't want to be a pageant person to say world peace, so I'll just <laughs> I'll stick to um, uh, science for now, since that's what I have. A, and at least in in the aging field, what to me would be uh, hugely monumental. And I think it's showing not just that we can get, you know, some life extension through treatment of disease, and, and by treatment I don't mean like reversal of disease. It means just keeping you know, kind of slowing the progression of some disease that's already occurred. So people are already in this disease state, but actually either hugely showing we can prevent disease in a large kind of swath of the population, um, a a diverse uh, group of the population and or uh, treating disease, but actually reversing it. So whether you can actually, you know, completely take a a, a whole human and make them quote healthier, however you define healthy. Um, so I think, and this comes back to this idea, kind of, to some degree of health span extension, but of course the reversal won't be necessarily health span extension because they'll have already acquired some disease. And I think if we can actually do that to a uh, significant degree, I don't know what that degree is. So whether you know, a 10 year age reversal is, I mean, I would think of that as very substantial. People disagree with me on kind of what is an, you know, a really good goal. Um, but yeah, I think like truly showing that you've taken someone back 10 years, um, not just, you know, one epigenetic age test that says that, um, I think would be a huge thing and just give people more years of healthy life and more ability to keep doing all the things that make us want to stay alive. Um, so yeah, that would be a huge thing for me. Yeah. 10 years um, sounds like a lot. And I know that I think you were also quite outspoken on Twitter again, against like the more immortalist, you know, like that, like that, you know, kind of pretty um, more out there bend in the sense that like, I, I like, I think how you um, take people a little bit back to the ground. Um, and I think otherwise, you know, having just massive expectation um, on like an, an entirely in, inconceivable and, and, and very unreachable super long lifetime, uh, lifespan, I think would just lead to lots of, um, yeah, failed expectations down the road. So I think 10 years is already like 
yeah, I'll take that. That's pretty ambitious to me. I think that, that sounds great. And do you have um, a specific, you know, could you color in that daily life more? Like usually what we're trying to do is really dead, almost like try, like making it more easier for people to imagine what it would feel like to actually live, uh, to live a life like that. And I know that this is more like a creative writing prompt, but nevertheless, I think people, you know, um, really, it would be nice to just uh, kickstart people's imagination. And I think uh, doing that from, uh, from your perspective, maybe, uh, maybe a cool thing. Yeah. So, I mean, let's say we imagine this happening in 30 years. I don't know. Maybe, I, who knows how long? Um, so I can just say personally, um, at that time I will be, you know, eligible for social security. Um, and so people can, you know, what we usually kind of stereotype that age and like to imagine that I, you know, could still, I mean, people that age are, are, you know, very functional still. So I'm not saying there's, I don't want to have any negative stigma um, towards uh, people in kind of um, older age, but, you know, to say that, well, maybe physically I won't be that different from where I am today. I'm maybe can go out and run a 5k at a similar pace that I can today. And I haven't developed any major product conditions, which most people that age have developed at least one major product condition or Maybe I will, but it can be reversed um, to some degree. And I mean, that to me would, I to feel like I haven't lost any of kind of the physical function or vitality that I have today would be very exciting. And great if you look younger too, but to me, it's more feeling younger and feeling healthy. And I think too, that takes away some of kind of the dread of aging that a lot of us feel. So it's not we have such a negative connotation of aging, but it's not chronological aging. That's the problem. It's all of these biological changes that go along with it. So if you can actually completely disentangle those and you can enjoy years and we don't dread our next birthday because we know it won't come with the accumulation of X number of potential pathologies or loss of some functioning, I think would be amazing. And we, I feel like we could enjoy life and have less of this kind of existential dread to some degree. Yeah, there's, I think, something to be said for longer lives also leading folks to have longer time horizons. And so I do actually think that, you know, to the extent that people are self-interested, even your, future, your, your later life years, you yourself are discounting by a lot. You know, that's always like really interesting, I think, in economics. Um, um, that a year now is not a year later. And, and I think we do the same, obviously with, with the future at large. And so I do think that there could be a lot of uh, collateral benefits also for many of the societal issues that we're facing down the line where we're just kicking the can on the road. <laughs> um, and, um, yeah, so I think one thing obviously that would also be really exciting about this is I think just having more time with friends and family, right? Like, I think that currently it's almost seems interesting that the later you push back, um, you know, for example, having kids as a female, um, you are also losing years with your children, um, right? Um, and so um, I think that that's a really main motivating factor, I think, also to to just have more time together <laughs> uh, as a family. Um, and I think in what you said about the disparities at the beginning, I actually thought that was interesting um, because on my mind, at least, and I, I, this is more an empirical question, right? But um, it would could also may as well also lead to like decreasing disparities in the sense that oftentimes it's really expensive to treat um, you know conditions later and when they occur and by actually being able to intervene at all also to reverse a few uh, pathologies um, it sounds to me almost like that would be on the long run obviously like a cheaper thing that could actually potentially have uh, hugely democratizing effects also on uh, people's abilities with lower incomes to have uh, longer lives and, and healthier lives. So I, I wonder if, um, you know, that could also, you know, does that sound plausible to you at all? And I know that's more an empirical question. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think that's, we, we always talk about extending maximal lifespan in aging. That seems to always be the goal, but I mean, there is so much we can do to just compress kind of the differences in lifespan and actually the greatest increase in, in kind of median life expectancy would actually come from saving all these individuals who are probably aging at a much more accelerated rate and thus making them look more like what we would consider the exceptional agers today. Um, 
And, and that's probably going to be easier than figuring out how to live to 160, 180 or to, I don't know, whatever all these speculations are and, and will be hugely beneficial to society, both, like you said, kind of economically, because we aren't, you know, treating people who tend to die earlier have an accumulation of lots of chronic diseases that are really expensive to treat. Um, they show that centenarians are actually much cheaper in their last few years of life than people who died much earlier. Um, so that, and also just the societal benefit for, in terms of people will be able, if they want to continue working and contributing to society for longer, spending more time, um, with loved ones and friends and family. And you no, know, I think there's a huge benefit to be had from trying to reduce kind of disp health disparities and life expectancy disparities. Great. Um, I think that one thing maybe just extrapolating also a little bit uh, down the line and um, the types of technologies, um, you know, needed for that. And, you know, you have a, obviously I think what makes science wonderful is that people really specialize and the more complex and the more progress we make, the more specialization we also need, because it's not really like one person can just <laughs> think back in the days, be a philosopher and a physicist and, and, and whatnot in a way where, um, even though, well, maybe someone like Feynman still could, but, uh, but I'm, um, but are there, do you see any um, potential areas where, um, and I know we already touched on the data and computation aspects, where you feel like different technologies or different areas that you are focused on, maybe touching each other more or maybe merging more? Like, um, I think especially, usually at what one of Fawcett's hypotheses is that the most interesting things happen like at the intersection of technologies and fields. Do you have any hunch as to like what technologies or like what different types of scientists do you look forward to collaborating with soon? Yeah, no, I think um, I completely agree with this. I feel like when I structure my lab, I try to get as multidisciplinary a group as I can possibly find. And I think too, the thing that's benefited me the most thinking about my training, it's been that it's been multidisciplinary. I've never been a specialist in anything. I, I find myself to be more of like a jack of all trades and an expert of none. Um, but I think it served me well because I can, you know, listen to people in very diverse fields and, and kind of take that information and integrate it into kind of my framework. Um, and there's a lot to pull from. I like to think of it as kind of sampling the landscape. So the more the landscape that you can, can sample um, in terms of information and science and thinking, the better you're going to be able to figure out where to focus um, rather than just sampling a small part and hoping the answer is there. Um, it's hard to say which things will, you know, be the best in terms of intersection. Um, I mean, again, I, I always come back probably to mathematics and biology. And I mean, I think biology has to be answered through kind of data science and mathematics. It's in and, and it, I put it in, math, in mathematics, also like computer science information theory. So biology is, is an information process, but we've never, we don't study it using kind of those tools. Um, or even that, you know, even people who study societies or, you know, the collapse of businesses, there, there are all these kind of complex system tools out there that if we apply them more to biology, I think will have huge potential. I agree. We just had a really fantastic um, nanotech researcher in our biotech group, and I was blown away by the types of toolings that we can come up with and, and even the types of uh, maybe long down uh, effects that different types of quantum states could have on the tooling that we can produce and on different uh, quantum bi biological states that will become relevant down the line. So I think that, yeah, we, we'll discover. There's certainly like a lot of, I think, really wondrous discoveries still uh, to, to be made. Um, okay. Uh, well, that's uh, it for me. Uh, I'll hand it over to uh, Beatrice maybe to uh, round off with a few more uh, personal cues, just like uh, we started off. And yep. Yeah, I think I'll just round off with um, like a last philosophical question um, to to close this this meeting off. Um, so this this will be a jump, <laughs> but it's it's just a, a good way to collect some wisdom nuggets for people, um, and it's just 
asking you what, what the best advice you ever got is. And if there's a story around that, I'd be very curious to hear it. Yeah. I mean, probably thinking about for me personally, it's been to kind of not let your like current state dictate where you want to go. Um, again, I think coming from not knowing I wanted to do science from the get-go and not, you know, preparing myself for that career. Then when I, you know, entered that career and had all these ambitions, I was really nervous about the fact that, oh, I don't have the, you know, specific background I should for, to do X, Y, or Z, or, you know, I can't take that class because then, you know, all these people are going to be so much further ahead of me. Um, And even, you know, continuing on in my career, I feel like I've just forced myself not to be afraid of trying to do things that even though I don't think that I might, you know, have all the tools at hand. And the, I, I'm always surprised every year looking back on like how much I've learned. And I, I feel like I'm a different scientist every year from where I was and just not letting anything kind of limit you. So even starting, again, I was a purely dry lab computational person. And I think a lot of people thought I was crazy to start like a full on wet lab, but I figured that's, I have to do that to be able to move to the next step in my science. And sure, I'm going to mess up and not always know what I'm doing and feeling insecure sometimes about uh, what I'm saying, but just not letting those insecurities and imposter syndrome kind of hold you back and just kind of diving in head first and you'll, you'll come out the other side and probably be better off for it. Yeah, I think that's great advice. I also think it's, uh, it's applicable to, to this, to society even in general on a larger scale that, you know, we don't necessarily have to be, uh, defined by what we currently are in the shape that we currently are. Um, so that's a very hopeful, hopeful nugget to, to end with. Um, yeah, I think those were all of my questions. Do we, do we want, do we have any other questions? Um, well, I think there, there, we could take a few audience questions too. Um, I think we had one from Walter Cromwell up uh, on the top. I don't know, Walter, if you're here. It was on um, Trim. Um, basically, Walter would like to know uh, whether, um, let's see, haven't the Trim trials already demonstrated persistent multi multiomic age reversal? Um, I mean, for me, I, I don't think anything has proven age reversal. Um, I think there may be hints of it, but I think we always need to be a lot more rigorous and actually proving out that we've accomplished that. I think that from the get-go is some of the issues with these biomarkers is that people take that. Uh, not that they don't work. I'm a huge proponent of them, and I think we can keep making them better, but we can't always you know, just take it at face value, you know, the numbers that you get out of that. There are definitely assumptions and biases and, and potential confounders that could, that need to be considered when we evaluate whether something actually reversed age. And, um, I don't have the best advice on exactly how we should do this, but yeah, I think there are always, you know, traditional, uh, primary outcomes to take into account as well. So I'm optimistic that we can have age reversal, but I personally don't think it's been proven yet. But we're on the right track, I guess, hopefully. Okay. Well, great. Thank you so much, Morgan, for, for taking the time to join us here and for, you know, uh, taking the uh, opportunity to think about these more philosophical questions. Um, yeah, and thank you so much for sharing. Um, thank you guys day. yeah this is really fun thanks you guys yeah thanks for experimenting with us with this different yeah. format and uh, i think that you're a big inspiration for many people in the field and um thanks a lot for being able to give us this more personal look i think that is really really useful for new folks um and i love what you said about the experience angle so thanks a lot and i hope you have a wonderful rest of your day thanks for joining us thank you guys that means a lot thank I, you I, I, I,